Amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 21 is kind of continuing the same theme that we've seen uh, 17, 18, and 19. God starts just dealing with a lot of civil matters, specifically how they're going to deal with uh, the case of murder or somebody being slain. And he's showing us here that what happens when the murder is not found. Of course, we talked about in the last couple weeks uh, in several different chapters what to do when the murder is found or if it's a case of manslaughter. It was not... Uh, it was an accident. You know, somebody gets killed on accident. They were to flee to a city. But here we're seeing the case where the murder, someone has been killed, but we don't know who did it. Uh, so there's even a course of action to be taken in this instance as well. And it says there in verse 1, If one be found slain in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, lying in the field, and it be not known who has slain him, then the elders and, the ju and thy judges shall come forth, and they shall measure unto the cities which are round about him that is slain, and it shall be that that which is next unto the slain man, even the elders of that city, shall take an heifer, which hath not been wrought with, and which not drawn in the oak. And the elders of that city shall bring down the heifer into a rough valley, which is neither eared nor sown. And they shall strike off the heifer's neck in the valley. And the priest, the son of Levi, shall come near for them. Uh, the, for them the Lord thy God hath chosen to minister unto him, to bless in the name of the Lord. And by their word shall every controversy and every stroke be tried. And all the elders of that city that are next unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley and shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. So God has some pretty elaborate instructions here, some real specific instructions uh, of what's supposed to take place even in the instance where we don't know who killed him. We don't know that this guy is slain in the field. It's obviously you know, uh, not a natural death, but nobody saw this. Who, who killed him? It's unknown. And what that should show us is that, again, as the theme has been these last few weeks when we're dealing with these topics, is that God is careful when it comes to innocent blood. You know, we talked about in the, in, in the, in a few weeks ago in Deuteronomy 19 about the fact that, you know, God even provided cities that the, that the slayer who killed somebody, you know, unintentionally could flee to. Why? That innocent blood be not shed in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for inheritance, and so blood be upon thee. You know, God is one who requites innocent blood unto people, even unto whole nations. And that's why he's really taking the time here and going through every one of these instances and circumstances where innocent blood has been shed and, and it needs to be dealt with. It's because God is a God of justice and he's going to avenge innocent blood. So he's going, that's why we have this elaborate kind of thing here with the heifer and going into a certain valley and the measuring under the nearest city. You know, God, there, there is no pass when it comes to innocent blood, basically. You know, people could be tempted to say, oh, we found this dead guy, but we don't know who did it, so, you know, big deal. We can't prove who did it, so obviously we're off the hook. The Bible says no. God wants to make sure that that's the case, that he wants diligent inquiry to be made. He wants people to go back to their city and ask, hey, did you see anything? Did you hear anything? Do you know anything about this? And that after they had done that, then they would come to this and do this procedure of striking off the head of the heifer, washing their, their hands over it in water, and, and confessing and say, we do not know who did this. <clears throat> and here's the thing. You say, well, this is kind of redundant. God talks about this a lot. Well, that's because God wants people to be sensitive to innocent blood being shed. He don't want, doesn't want us being hardened to this topic. And quite frankly, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but that is what's going on in this country. People are, you know, and even this world, people have become very hardened to this type of thing to where it's just kind of not a big deal. Right? Before we get into that, though, I want to talk a little bit about some of the symbolism that's here, though, because I, I think this is interesting that he chooses a specific animal and it's done in a certain place that this procedure is all taken care of. So first of all, he says that they were to take a heifer, right? If you look there in verse 3, he says, And it shall be that the city was next, uh, next unto the slain man. Well, first of all, what they do is they would measure. They would probably pace off the nearest cities, and then whoever was nearest to that city you know, they're the ones that were going to, to go through all this, right? And they would take a, a heifer there, and it says in verse 3, uh, that even the elders shall take an heifer which hath not been wrought with, meaning they didn't put it to any work, right? Which hath not drawn in the yoke. Now, if you've spent any time around, uh, you know, uh, uh, dairy animals or anything like that, bovine, you know, a heifer is a, a cow that has not been impregnated. It is a cow that has not given birth, okay? It's a cow that has not you know, brought forth after its kind. So that's what a heifer is, all right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a young cow. And there's sen I, I believe that the, the, the symbology here is, what does that heifer represent? 
You know, and elsewhere in, in other passage that talks about the red heifer that was to be burned and its ashes taken out. You know, that there's a lot of symbology, I believe, there with Christ. But this one, you know, in particular, I believe is to remind these men of the lost potential in this life. That's what God is showing us here. Because a heifer, you know, is an animal that has a lot of potential. You know, when I worked for a short time on a dairy farm, you know, you knew who the heifers were and you paid attention to them. And you waited to see when they got pregnant, when they were, were going to calve. And you took care of them because after they calve, then they can produce milk. You know, there's a lot of potential in a heifer. You know, a lot of gain can be made. And I believe that's why God is saying, hey, you need to use a heifer that hasn't done any work and that has not rot, hasn't been in the yoke. Because what it's showing us is that this person that's been slain, you know, that's a loss of life. That's a lot. That person is not going to be able to do a lot of the things that they would have been able to do. That's some of the symbology. And I'm sure there's other, you know, more meaningful things you could probably get out of that. But when I'm reading that, that's what I see. Is that they're saying, hey, you know, just like this heifer is, is a waste, so is this man's life. You know, we shouldn't just, you know, turn a blind eye to that and say, oh, that's too bad. You know, that's a, that's a wasted life. A life that could have been productive. A life that could have done great things for God. <coughs> you know, the slain there, they had much to offer in life, potentially. You know, it could have been an innocent person who had a family or would have had a family or could have done a lot of different things. <coughs> what about the symbolism of the fact that it was done in a rough valley, right? That kind of shows, I believe what that's showing us there is the manner of death that this person died, you know, unknown. Because it was done in a valley where it was not eared nor sown. If you look there in verse 4, and the elders of that city shall bring uh, the, uh, down the heifer into a rough valley, which is neither eared nor sown, and shall strike off the heifer's neck. You know, people don't gravitate towards rough valleys, especially if they're trying to, you know, farm the land. This is probably, they were going to a place that it was uninhabited. They're going to a place that people wouldn't venture. You know, he's trying to get people to kind of realize what's taking place here with this slain individual. You know, one, a life has been wasted, and two, the manner in which this person died. There was no one there to witness it. You know, this was done unawares. This was done something, uh, you know, where nobody was there to see it. It was done down in, in, a, in a sort of a rough valley, you know, where nobody is. <coughs> and it was not known. It was, not, it was unseen by others because it's uninhabited. And then, of course, there's the striking off of the heifer's neck, okay? And, of course, he clarifies later in the passage that he said when they have beheaded it. So that's what it means by striking off the neck it means that's where you're going to hack the head off okay and it's the beheading of the animal in verse six is where that's clarified and you have to think you know there this isn't talking about a guillotine okay and i, and I you know i'm, I'm going to paint a little bit of a gruesome picture here you know it, it, cutting off the, the head of an animal is no that's not a quick process and it's not a pleasant one you know it did they didn't say kill it and then do it they said that's how you're going to kill it I mean, that's, you know, there's sawing, there's hacking, there's, there's going to be a lot of screaming and kicking and yelling, and uh, it's very painful and, and, and a very unpleasant process. You know, I remember when I, <coughs> you know, I, whenever the cows come up in the Bible, I love it because I can, you know, make a lot of analogies having worked on a dairy farm. You know, I remember we used to have to go through this process called dehorning. You know, if they, if they didn't get them when they were little, they'd burn the, the little, when they're just little cows and they're little uh, the, uh, the horns first come through, they're just these little round, just marble-sized little bits of bone popping through their head, and you just take a hot iron, it's got a cup on it, and just hold it on there, and it, it just kills the nerve instantly, and burns it off, and it pops out, and then they don't have any horns. But if, you're, if you get a little lazy, and you don't do that, and then the horns start to grow, and those animals get bigger, then you gotta go in there, and gra wrangle them, and take these big, what's you know, basically giant shears, and cut off these horns off their head and blood spurts and animals kick. It's very unpleasant. I don't enjoy it at all. I didn't, they found no pleasure in it. I knew somebody else who was a little crazy that kind of got into that, but <laughs> it's weird, right? Yeah. But that's what, th that, you know, now imagine and you know, say, oh, I can't believe you cut off its horns. Well, imagine having to go and hack its head off. And that's what God's saying to do here. Take this animal down into the valley and chop off its head. You know, God doesn't really sit there and, you know, get real graphic because he doesn't have to. We all understand the process that's involved here. It's not just, you know, there was no Japanese katana blade that was just, and it was just done, you know, or whatever they say when they do that. You know, it was like, whack, whack, whack. I mean, you can just imagine the scene. Let that sink in. Say, why, why would God do that? Why couldn't they just, you know, just stone it or, or kill it quickly or just let it, you know, cut its throat and let it just bleed out real fast? 
you know, pass out before it even dies? Why couldn't they just have a more humane way of doing it? Because he's trying to remind us of what happened to this individual. I mean, murder is a gruesome thing. We, we get, feel bad about what happened to this cow, but can you imagine what that person went through when their life's being snuffed out in a violent way? I believe that's what God's trying to impress upon these people about what's taken place in their land is that there's been a loss of, of life, a loss of potential, that it's happened you know, in a rough valley where there's nobody around, no one to hear him scream, no one to come to help, no aid, just feeling completely alone and helpless at the hands of, of some predator or murderer, whatever it is. And then, of course, the actual violent course of death that this person had to suffer. And that's what God's trying to impose on, the, you know, impress upon these people. So when they finally say, hey, I don't know anything about it, that they're, you know, they've, they make sure that that is in fact the case. <coughs> so I believe that's what a lot of this symbolism is. It's, it's not so much as this great spiritual application. It is it's just God trying to impress upon these people what's taking place in your land. Murder, violence, you know, and gruesome things have happened. <coughs> so yeah, that's what I think that was going on there. And, you know, it probably made them more accountable when they went through this, when they would go through this process you know, and, and they realize, hey, we know the protocol here. And, you know, quite frankly, I'm not really looking forward to going hacking off some, you know, hiking down in some rough valley and chopping off the head of, you know, a perfectly good animal. I'm not looking forward to that. So if I'm one of these judges, you know, if I'm one of these elders in the city, I'm going to probably make more diligent inquiry. I'm going to go back. And I'm not just going to be lackadaisical about it. Ask a few people, eh, you know about it? Well, we just got to go down this valley and cost it. I don't want to do that. You know, one, because of the impression that's been made upon me about what's happened, but also because that's a huge inconvenience and a waste. And I'm going to swear before God that I don't know anything about it. So now I'm going to go back to my city and I'm going to ask everyone. And I'm going to make sure nobody knows anything and, and get to the bottom of it. That's probably, you know, what took place here, or at least should have. You know, if, you know as I'm thinking this through, I'm thinking it made them more accountable. It made them... And, you know, and likely forced a more diligent inquiry in their communities. And, uh, <coughs> you know, you say, well, why, why was it the people that were closest to the guy? Because that's most likely where the murderer was. I mean, who here has ever tried to hide a body? It's not easy. I mean, so I've heard, <laughs> right? You, you would have to, of course, it's probably going to come from the nearest city because, you know, it's probably, you know, you know try picking up somebody who just goes completely limp. You're like, oh, they're only a couple, you know, 180 pounds, 140 pounds, whatever, if they're just, even if they're just little. All those joints and everything, they're very difficult to move uh, a human. So that's probably, you know, someone would only go so far, as far as, as they needed to go, you know, before they felt like, well, this is a good spot, you know, and they would get rid of them. <coughs> so that's probably why they chose the nearest city. <coughs> now, look there in verse 8, it says, uh, be merciful, O Lord, unto thy people Israel, whom thou hast redeemed, and lay no innocent blood unto thy people of Israel char Israel's charge, and the blood shall be forgiven them. So that's what these guys are praying there at the end of verse 7. They shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. Be merciful, O God. You know, because, and why are they asking for mercy? Again, because God avenges innocent blood. They're begging for mercy. They're doing all this. They're saying, We made a diligent inquiry. We brought the heifer. We're going through this process. God, we don't know anything. Please be merciful unto us. <clears throat> Lay not innocent blood unto thy people uh, of Israel's charge, and the blood shall be forgiven them. You know, God's, you know God is not, God is very uh, just, and God definitely executes wrath and justice, but there's always a way to get mercy from God. And, you know, here's a way to do it. And this is what they had to you know. If they decided not to do this, would, they, would God grant them that mercy? Would they be free from the guilt of this innocent blood? No, they wouldn't. They had to go through this process. And he says in verse 9, So shalt thou put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you, when thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. You know, you don't want to be guilty? Do what's right. <clears throat> so the whole purpose of this, whole you know, this whole process, is to give account for the innocent blood. You know, and the elders, they were going to be the ones that were going to be making the inquiry and that they were going to be truthful in saying that they knew nothing of it. And here's the thing. They might not know anything about it, but God knows that, whether or not that's the case. You know, the, the Bible says, you know, uh, be not hasty to utter anything before God. 
You know, they don't want to show up there on this day and say, well, we don't know anything about it. Well, the whole time God's going, well, it's because you didn't make diligent inquiry. The murder is in your city, buddy. You know, if you'd asked around a little bit more, you would have found that out. You know, God's trying to get them to do the right thing here by making this process, you know, difficult and unpleasant. And what people need to understand is that, you know, you can't just, just say, well, I don't know anything about it if you haven't really looked into it. You know, if, if we haven't really tried to get to the bottom of, of things. And, you know, they would also understand, these elders, they would understand that God knows who did do it, you know. It was Professor Plum with the candlestick and, the, you know. God, God has the, all the cards. He knows who did this. And what God is doing here with, this, with all of these things, and what we have to take away from all this, because obviously we're not doing this today. You know, and we as individuals, specifically the people in this room, we're never going to do this. We're not elders in some city. What, why do we even have to read this today? What does it even matter to any of us in the room about this red heifer and cutting off its head in some valley somewhere? What does it even matter? Well, it's good for us to read these things and hear these things because it, it's impressing upon us the fact that God hates the shedding of innocent blood and that God does not want us to become calloused to things like murder and violence. God doesn't want us to become callous to these things. And quite frankly, our society has. Our society is very hardened to things like murder. You know, and any one of us that have grown up you know, watching any amount of you know, television or movies, we could probably confess one to another that our, even our own hearts have become calloused to things like murder. Just from all the entertainment we've seen, just from all the movies we've seen, you know, Rambo, The Terminator, The Predator, all these you know, action flicks where just people are getting blown to bits and shot up and everything else. Where it's just like, oh yeah, that's, you know, most people, you know, there was a time you would never see anything like that except in real life. Right. And it would shock you. It would have a real, because it would be real. We just watch it, it's as real as it could be as on television. And we look at it and go, oh yeah, that's, you know, after a while, well, that's normal. And what happens is what we're, we're becoming desensitized. We're becoming callous to this. And you know, the, qu the, the philosophical question is, if you're watching something that's depicted as real, isn't it just as good as real? I mean, so it's make-believe, yeah, but it's depicting an actual event right. in a very realistic way. So is it really fake? That's the thing we have to ask ourselves. And that's where our society is. I mean, every other movie that comes out is somebody, some psycho killer horror story, you know, people mangling each other, some murderer, you know, they're, they're just, they abound. It's everywhere. We have it, and we're living in a society that has become calloused to murder and violence. <coughs> you know, it's, it's a form of entertainment. You know, the murder mystery specials. You know, they'll show you the, you know, the blurred out images from the, the crime scene. You know, and then they explain the whole story, you know, 48 hours and all these other things. All, and it just becomes a form of us just to entertain, just to pass the time. We're just gonna, we're just gonna kill time by just watching some murder by just watching some innocent blood be shed. That's where this society is. And you know, God is, you know, so that's why it matters. That's why we should spend a little time in Deuteronomy chapter 21 tonight. Maybe to shake us and wake us up a little bit and understand that murder isn't just, you know, a fun thing to watch on television. That people really do get killed. That people, innocent blood really is being shed even today. And that we don't want to become calloused people towards it. You know, I mean, do we have to talk about abortion? I mean, is there not innocent blood just being shed in this land? Are people not callous to that? I mean, they're so callous, they stand up and say it's our right to do it. And they'll make signs and march up and down Washington and every other street and have their special days and, and they'll go to work and they'll get their you know, political movements together and elect their candidates to make sure that they can continue to shed innocent blood in this country. That's how hardened we are in this country today to innocent blood. <coughs> And God is taking time in his word to, to cover every aspect of what to do when innocent blood has been shed. If it's done intentionally, if it's done accidentally, if it's, it's, if it's done and we don't know who did it, God's taking at it from all angles. <coughs> so he says there in verse 10, When thou goest forth to war against thine enemies, and the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thine hands, and thou hast taken them captive, and seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast a desire unto her that thou wouldst have her to thy wife, then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails, and shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her. 
and shall remain in thine house and bewail her father and her mother a full month. And thou shalt then, and, and after that thou shalt go in unto her and be her husband, and she shall be thy wife. So this is kind of a you know an interesting passage. Um, you know, God's dealing with how to handle, you know, if, if a guy, you know, he's out at war and he sees one of these these beautiful women and says, you know, he's looking for a wife, you know, and she's available because, you know, her family just got wiped. It's kind of an odd circumstance, right? But he says, hey, I want to make this woman my wife. And you say, well, what's up with the shaving of the head and the paring of the nails? What's going on there? You know, and but you have to remember, he's bringing home a beautiful woman, okay, meaning that she's very fair to look upon. You know, she's pleasant to look at. And I believe why God's doing this, having her do this, is to remind that guy that beauty is only skin deep. You know, we, we look at her and go, oh, she's gorgeous. Well, is she going to look that good with a shaved head? You know, oh, her nails are so nice. Well, cut them things off. And, you know, and I, I guess that probably back then, maybe that was more of an attractive thing, more of, you know, there, d don't get me wrong, it's still out there today. There's the ladies with the giant press-ons and the, you know, the huge just claws out there with all the glitter and the blitz on it and Blitz, did I say? I meant bling. <laughs> I'm bling and glitz put together. That's blitz, people. Bam! Coined it. All right? It's out there. That's going to be in the Urban Dictionary. Blitz. <laughs> What's blitz? That's when you got, you got bling and glitz together. You got blitz. It's not just a football move anyway. But that was probably a thing back then. You know, they, they would, maybe it was a sign of decadence, you know, or, or beauty, how beautiful you could make your nails. So God's saying, yeah, you can have her, but make sure you shave her head and cut her nails. And not only that, then she's going to bewail her mo father and mother a full month. You know, just, you know, she's going to be in the state of mourning, you know, and, and it's not going to be pleasant. And I believe what God is showing here again is that beauty is only skin deep. That what what's matters the most is what's on the inside. And that this guy better be, be sure about what he's doing because, you know, there's more to marriage than just a pretty face. That he needs to make sure that this is, you know, really what he wants. You know, and nothing will strike bring that home to reality more than a bald morning woman with short nails. <laughs> you know, just bewailing and bald and, and not, you know, all the attractiveness is gone. You know, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to get my, I've got something. I feel like I just, if I say it, I'm going to get in trouble, so I'm done. I'll say it. I'll, I'll risk it for you. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like the morning, the morning face, right? The wife gets up, you know. Oh, my wife's so beautiful. Yeah, did you see her? She first gets up, you know, and <laughs> hasn't done anything, hasn't taken a shower, you know, and she's been up with the kids for like four nights in a row, and, you know, and it's, it's just life has just been hard, <laughs> you know. But, the, you know, he, you, this is an important point, though, because, you know, especially guys that aren't married, you better think about this. That, you know, there's a lot more to a woman than just the way she looks, right. you know. You know, beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Amen. And quite frankly, you know, the, the mourning face and the hair and all that, when it's, when it's it, for a good reason, is a beautiful thing. Amen. <laughs> Got myself out of that one. <clears throat> but I think that's what's going on here. God's just you know, saying, you know, that's fine if you want to take this woman to wife, but make sure it's for the right reasons. Make sure it's not just, you know, because... She's beautiful. I mean, she might be beautiful, but, you know, a fair woman, with, with, which is without discretion, is as a jewel of gold in a swine's snout. It just doesn't belong there. And not only that, it's a complete waste, it, you know, to take a jewel of gold and put it in a swine's snout. <coughs> so I think that's what God's getting at here. And this is also a great proof text that what, what validates a marriage is consummation. And we talked about this a little bit after service with another brother this morning about, you know, what constitute when a person's married. And, and of course, I believe the vows are a big part of that. You know, just consummation is not, is what makes or breaks a marriage. But I believe that if, if, if people, if people were to make vows in a marriage and then the wedding night comes and they just have a knockdown drag out fight and it's not consummated, that marriage could be annulled. You know, because we see in the Bible that that's what constitutes a marriage or that's what seals a marriage is when they become together and become one flesh. Okay? And you see that, multiple examples of that. You see that here in verse 13 where he says, She shall put uh, uh, the raiment of her capi captivity from off her and shall remain in thine house and bewail her father and her mother a full month. And after that thou shalt go in unto her. That's talking about the consummation of a marriage. That's how the Bible puts that, that phrase. And be her husband and she shall be thy wife. 
So it's not when he brought her home. It's not when he said, hey, you're going to be my wife, and she was consented and went with him. It's not any of that. It was when, when he went in, uh, unto her, that's what made her finally his wife. That's what made them husband and wife. You know, another example of that would be Genesis chapter 24, when Isaac, it says, Isaac brought in her in unto, her mother, uh, unto his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah and became his wife, and he loved her. You know, and they went into the tent to consummate the marriage. So that's what made that there. So, you know, marriage is just is, is more than just vows and companionship. Okay, and we talked about this a little bit this morning. And this is kind of a delicate subject, but you know what? There's married people in the room. And there's people that are going to be married one day. And this is an aspect of marriage that the Bible addresses. So I don't feel ashamed or out of place to address it. So we're going we're gonna to talk about it for a minute. If you would, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The Bible hits it dead on. Takes it, takes it right, take, you know, goes right at this. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then it doesn't apply to you. Okay? But if you're old enough and mature enough and you've learned about the birds and the bees, then you know what I'm talking about. You know? <coughs> so if you don't, then you, know, you can just zone out for a minute, I guess. I don't know. <coughs> but 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it says in verse 1, Now concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render due unto the wife due benevolence. Okay, that's talking about the physical relationship within marriage, rendering that due benevolence. And likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over, uh, of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So, a couple of things we can get out of this is that, you know, marriage is important not just for the reasons we talked about this morning, you know, the continuation of the human race, you know, or enjoying that special, uh, you know, relationship, you know, the companionship and everything like that. This is a very important aspect of of a reason why to get married to satisfy that physical need that is in, is in all of us that every person has to, to, to satisfy that that's a perfectly valid reason to get married and then that's I me mean, what he's saying there you know nevertheless to avoid fornication you know he said elsewhere it's better to marry than to burn okay <coughs> so that's one reason to get married and it's also an aspect of marriage that is not to be abused meaning not used as a means of control over the other person. You know, you should never use this as a means of control over your spouse. Right. You say, that's crazy. People do it all the time. People say, you know, that you're sorry, no, not happening. You know, I have the headache. You know, they don't like something you did. And it could go either way. You know, whether it's the wife to the man or the, the husband to the wife. You know, and they use this as a power play in their marriage. You know, they dangle it over their heads. They use it as a carrot, proverbial carrot, dangling out in front of them. And the Bible says don't do that. In fact, when you really think about when you have that kind of an attitude within marriage, that's a wicked sin. Because yep. look what it leads to. It leads to temptation. He says, you know, defraud ye not one another. What does it mean to defraud somebody? Rob them of something that's rightfully theirs. That's what he's saying there. He's saying, look, the wife hath not power over no body but the husband. Likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body but the wife. You know, if, if they have that need, it is your duty within marriage to satisfy that need. And when you fail to do that, you're defrauding them. You're saying you're holding back and you're robbing them of what's rightfully theirs. And, you know, here's the thing. That doesn't just mean that their desire for that satisfaction disappears. It's still there. And the one person that they have been given by God to help them with that and to meet that need is defrauding them and saying no. And what is that going to lead to? Well, it says right there uh, that they, at the end of verse 5, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. It leads to temptation. It leads to you know, a husband saying, well, if, I, you know, if she's not going to help me out, I'm just going to go find it somewhere else. Does that kind of thing happen? Better believe it does. So don't use that you know, within marriage as a power play over your spouse. Or as a means to get what you want or something like that. Because what you're doing is you're defrauding your partner, you know, your spouse, your husband, your wife, and you know, they're just going to end up going looking for it somewhere else eventually. 
they're just going to get fed up, you know, potentially, you know, maybe not, maybe not certainly, but I mean, do you really want to find out? Do you want to open that door and see how they react? <laughs> no. You know, for the simple fact that, you know, God is saying, look, it's your duty within marriage to render due benevolence unto your spouse. <clears throat> so again, you know, the Bible addresses this uh, head on. Go ahead and turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 21. And we'll get back into, you know, the bald-headed woman with, with short nails, you know. What, let's, let's get back to that situation. Meanwhile, you know, back in the, in the house of the bald-headed woman, it says in verse 14, And it shall be, if thou have no delight in her, then sh shalt thou let her go whither she will. So he's saying, look, if, if it turns out, you know, uh, that, you know, you look at that bald head for a whole month and them short nails and listen to that bewailing, yeah, you know, and say, you know what, in second thought, she's, she's not my type, you know. Then it says, then thou shalt let her go whither she will. You know, that, then you can release her from, that, from that, that marriage. But it goes on and says, but thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Thou shalt not make merchandise of her because thou hast humbled her. Okay? So God's putting this clause in here because God doesn't want people to turn into human traffickers. You know, and that's potential, you know, especially when you're involved in warfare. You know, if you're the if you're the conquering people and you have, you know, just this this sudden, you know, quite frankly a resource is what they would consider it, you know, of human life, they could sell them into slavery and all kinds of things. And God's saying, not so, not, you know, if, if you don't want her, let her go, you know, and, and you're not going to sell her. You're not going to make merchandise of her. <coughs> because, quite frankly, that could become a practice. You know, and, and, you know, I mean, that goes on even today. That type of thing happens. You know, pe man, man's heart is wicked and they, they traffic human beings, you know, all the time. And God's, you know, the God's addressing that. And here's what, this is another example of what I just love about the Bible, is that God just sees man coming a mile off. In all these instances, we've talked about it, several different examples, you know, like polygamy. You know, God makes all these clauses and these exceptions, not exceptions, but, you know, well, when you did do it, you know, and divorce. Well, when you do get divorced, even though I told you not to do it, when you do it, write a bill of a divorcement. You know, I told you not to get, have multiple wives, but, you know, when you do it, because I know you, you're going to do it because you're fallen, you're man, you're predictable, you're going to disobey, you're going to disregard my word. When you, when you go ahead and multiply wives, just make sure you render due benevolence and you don't diminish the needs of the first wife. You know, and the son is not, the firstborn son is not going to be robbed of his double portion of, of the inheritance. And here's another great example where God just says, you know what? you're going to go ahead and see that pretty face, bring her home, shave her head, and then realize, well, whoa, what have I got myself into? And he's saying, now you can't sell her because I know what you're like. Because I know that man, is, his heart is deceitfully wicked above all things who can know it. And there's a very good, strong potential that you'll get that idea and think, well, I can just sell her for money. And God just sees man coming a mile off. And, and, and we're just so predictable. And his ways are so far above our ways. You know, and we would just... Humanity would just do so well to just open up this book and just think about it and read it and know it, understand it, and then practice it. <coughs> so he goes on here in verse 15. If a man have two wives, keyword there is if, okay? Not when, okay? Saying if, because we've talked about this at length, you know, and I, and I, I know I'm being a little redundant here, but that's what's here tonight is that if a man has two wives, again, polygamy, not condoned in Scripture, if he have two wives, one beloved and another hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated, and if the firstborn, be son, firstborn son be hers that was hated. So in saying, look, the guy ends up with two wives and he ends up hating one of them. But it turns out that the son, the firstborn son, is born of the wife that he hates. There's a, there's a, a provision here. Verse 16, Then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath. See, the firstborn son, according to God's uh, custom, receives a double portion of the inheritance. When a man would divide up his inheritance among his sons, the firstborn son got a double portion. And he's saying, you know, if the firstborn son of a certain man who's multiplied himself wives, you know, has taken more than one wife, 
he can't show favor to that son because of, of who his mother is. If he's indeed the firstborn son, he has to honor him as the, uh, the firstborn son because he is the beginning of his strength, as he says there. <coughs> the, first, the right of the firstborn is his. So again, just another great example of God just knows what man's going to do and, and, it just, and just goes ahead and just addresses it before man even has, gets himself into that position. He goes on in verse 18. Of course, this is another real popular passage that you know haters of God love to pull out of context and misquote and misapply. And anytime any preacher nowadays, it seems like, gets up and actually preaches this portion of Scripture as it is written, they sometimes find themselves in hot water with a bunch of you know, uh, liberal, God-hating uh, folks. <clears throat> it says here in verse 18, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when, uh, when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him unto the elders of the city and unto the gate of his place, and they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious and will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of this city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put away evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Now, there's, a lot to un there's not a lot to unpack, but there's some things you need to understand about this. This is not talking about young children. Okay, kids, take a, take a deep breath. You're okay. Right? Well, how do you know that? Because of what it says there at the end of verse 19. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Right? It's not speaking about a child. It's speaking about a grown adult child. A young man, a, specifically a young man, who is neglecting his personal responsibilities. It's talking about a bum. Some, some kid who grows up, becomes a young man, and is just a bum. He's worthless. He's a glutton. He's a drunkard. He won't take correction. And he's guilty of riotous living. Go ahead and turn over to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. You can't, you know, newsflash, you can't be a, a, a riotous glutton, a riotous drunkard as a child. I mean, I suppose it's possible. But that's not what the Bible's talking about in all practicality here. You know, in the realm of reality, that's not what takes place. You know, uh, people don't become these things until they get a little older in life. You know, in their late teen years, maybe, when they start to get some independence, early 20s, or whenever, beyond that point, where people can start to exercise their own will and, not, and begin to just disobey their parents whenever they feel like it and kind of live their own life. <coughs> Children can't do this. You know, I'm never afraid I'm going to walk in one day and find little Corbin John with a fifth of, you know, Jack Daniels hiding out behind the bunk beds, just slamming it, you know, and put that down. No! You know, and just telling me what for as he's walking around like a crazy little drunk, right? Not worried about that. Why? Because it's not even possible. You can't do it. It's talking about a grown adult here. <coughs> and a proof of that, you know, is in Luke 15. It says, it talks about the proverbial son. Remember how he got himself into the position that he got himself into? Where he's eating with, a, a, when he would fain fill his belly with the, with the husks that the, the swine fed upon after he spent all of his substance. And it says, and not many days after the young son gathered together all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with what? Riotous living. He said, give me my portion of inheritance. And when he got it, he goes off and he wastes it with riotous living. It's not talking about the fact that he went down you know, to South Central LA and threw a brick through a window. And, and you know, it's not that kind of a riot you know, where he's just grabbing stereo speakers and everything. It's talking about being a riot, you know, like the Bible says, a riotous eater of flesh. Being a glutton, being a drunkard, that would be a, what's considered a riotous person. They're, they're, you know, uh, the deacons are not to have children accused of riot or unruly, right? I mean, we don't have kids that are out there just you know, hanging out at the club, you know, hung over you know, all, every day of the week, and just, just riotous people, just living uh, the life of a glutton and a drunkard. Look there in Proverbs 23, verse 19. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. You know, don't be around drunks. Don't be around gluttonous people. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Go over to Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 28. You're right there. So again, what does it mean to be riotous? 
You know, it means to be a, like a wine bibber, a drunk. It means to be a person who is a, an eater of flesh, you know. That's why the one time I went into a Brazilian steakhouse, I didn't stay long because I realized I was about to turn into a riotous eater of flesh because that meat just keeps coming and coming and coming. Who's ever been to those Brazilian steakhouses? Man, you turn, man, you guys got to go. <laughs> I'm telling you. you turn that little thing over, green, and they just, everybody's walking by with just all these, you know, different cuts of meat and they just keep putting on your plate and putting your plate. I mean, meat just keeps coming out of the kitchen for as long as you sit there. And I, we, it was when we were moving out here from Michigan, we stopped in Albuquerque to stay for the night. We went to this place. And I, after about 30 minutes, I said, we better get out of here. I'll be here all night. <laughs> you know, they're bringing me all these chicken hearts and, you know, all this different steak and everything. It was pretty good. So anyway, I don't know what that has to do with anything. But look at Proverbs 28, verse 7. Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son, but he that is a companion of riotous men shameth his father. You know what? It's not just that the dad's going to hang his head and say, oh, my son's a, you know, a, a, he's a companion of riotous men. Oh, my son's a drunkard and a, and a wine bibber and, and an eater of flesh. You know, he's, he's all these things. It's not just that he's going to feel ashamed. It's that other people are going to look at that son and go, well, your father, you know, they're, they're going to be ashamed of his father. They're going to be ashamed of him. It's going to soil his reputation. I mean, that's why, you know, the, 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 uh, <coughs> The uh, qualifications for the bishop and the deacon are, are to rule your house well, as an example. You know, that you are to have your house in order so that you can take care of the church of God. So he's saying, look, if, if your son, you know, is a companion of riotous men, it, it's going to bring your father to shame. You know, because he, what it means is he didn't raise you right. He didn't teach you things. He didn't instruct you and, and beat that fire out of you young and teach you the right from wrong. Uh, so, you know, those of us, you know, that, that didn't have that growing up, you know, and have, you know, by the grace of God made something, you know, of our, ourselves for, for the Lord and, and got out of that, you know, praise God for that. But those that are in a house that has a dad that is teaching them to not be these things, they ought to thank God for that. They ought to thank God that they have a dad who doesn't want this to be their end, you know. Because what was God's law? What, was the, what did we just read about? Back in the day, they'd just say, oh, you don't want to listen? You want to keep doing your own thing? You don't want to go to work and just be a lazy bum? Let's go talk to the elders of the city because I'm not going to sit here as your father and suffer shame because of you. We'll deal with it. And you say, that's kind of a harsh penalty. But what, it, but what does God say about it? In verse uh, 21, And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die so shall thou put evil away from among you. God says, look, these people, these bums, these derelicts, these drug addicts, these drunkards, these lazy jerks who don't want to get a job, these young, fully able-bodied young men who just want to hang out down here at the turnpike and beg for your hard-earned money, anything helps on their stupid sign, and not listen to their parents, not listen to their elders, disregard all their instruction and just be ashamed of their own father. The Bible says that they, bring, they are an evil influence on society. Because now all kids are walking by, oh, I could just do that. Oh, look at that guy. He's free. He doesn't listen to anybody. Yeah, and he also sleeps in a gutter. He probably smells like a trash can. And who knows all the other problems he has. That's not free. And he's, a, he's an evil on society. Those are the guys that, you know, are getting so hooked on drugs, they have to go break into your car and steal something. And take your, take your stuff. Or commit any kind of violent crimes. I mean, they can get into some of the worst things that are out there. And it's God saying, look, put them away from you. Put this evil away from you. Don't suffer it. You know, and, and, and people want to reel at that and go, oh, I don't know about that. Boy, well, I don't think we've really stopped to consider the, the blight upon society that these people are that they bring evil upon a society and that's what the bible says they're riotous drunkard they're they're stubborn they're rebellious they will not be corrected and it's not like they're saying you know the first time you talk to him and he says no that's it you're done he's saying look we've he, we've uh, uh they, they they said this our son is stubborn and rebellious you know how to prove somebody's stubborn you have to keep you have to find that out right. you know it's not just like you, maybe you just well, I'm going to just make my son stubborn. I'll just whisper it, tell him to do something just, just loud enough to where he can't hear it. Just like, hey, son, go mow the lawn. 
Oh, he won't do it. Oh, he's stubborn. Let's get rid of him. You know, you, you'd be saying, son, mow on. Go get a job. Raise a family. Go get a, you know, work. Quit, quit being a drunk. It would just be, you know, rebuke after rebuke after rebuke. And just, no, no, no. And the Bible says, you know, he that being often reproved and hardened at this neck shall be su destroyed suddenly and that without remedy. And finally, dad would just, mom and dad would just say, okay, well, we've had enough. Rather than just here, sitting here and just, you know, being the source of, of evil upon a society and, and suffering shame and having our own reputation just drugged through the mud because of your lack of discipline and, and laziness, we're just going to take care of business. <clears throat> and he says he's stubborn, he's rebellious. He's being told what to do and he will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Now, here's the thing. How, and he says here, if so thou shalt put away evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. You know, not get triggered. You know, not, not rage on social media. I can't believe you'd say that. No, the, if this actually, it's one thing for to say it, but if this actually happened, you know what the reaction would be? If a society actually made this a rule, if this was the law of the land, you watch how quick these guys get a job. You watch how quick these guys get off the drugs, clean up, you know, get, an act, get their act together and go out and, and take care of business. I don't think this happened to ha had to happen if it, very much. In fact, I don't think it ever did. I don't, you know, they probably never enacted it. Maybe they did. I don't know. But how many times would you have to be that guy and see that happen to your buddy? You know, you're hanging out under the underpass trying to score some smack or something yep. and your buddy's gone because mom and dad hauled him off to the elders and now he's dead. And now you're going to go, you're probably going to rethink your life decisions at that point and say, what's really important to me? Maybe it's time for me to get some help and quit being so stubborn and rebellious and actually get serious about life and, and, and being a productive member of society and not a, dra you know, a, a drain on it. So, <clears throat> you know, that's kind of a hard thing in the word of God, but it's there. And quite honestly, it would probably do people a lot of good. You know, it would do society a lot of good. It'd be unfortunate for the, you know, the first few people that had to set the, the, the example. But, you know, it would, as a whole, you know, it would, it would help things. There would be a lot, uh, there would be a fewer unoccupied, you know, underpasses. You know, all those tent cities up in Portland. You ever been, and who's here ever been, ever been to Portland? You know, it's totally legal to just, just pitch a tent anywhere in Portland, practically. I mean, I visited there once years ago, and I just we'd go into underpasses and just be tents everywhere. They're just like, yeah, they just let them come here. And they're protected. They can't be kicked off, and they're just allowed to hang out. Well, you know what? Deuteronomy 21 them, and watch how quickly they put the old Coleman away, <laughs> you know, and start looking for a place to take a shower and shave, and there'll they'll be a you know, Taco Bell application, Arby's application. Every fast food place in the, in the city would probably have a, you know, a roster of people. You know, they could take down the help wanted sign. <coughs> so that's, that's that. We'll move on here. Verse 22, for the sake of time here. It says, and if a man have committed a sin worthy of death. So there are certain sins that are worthy of death in the Bible. And he be, and he be put to, to death and thou hang him on a tree. So he's saying, look, if you decide to, that's his punishment, that you're going to hang him on a tree. His body shall not remain all night upon the tree. So whether he's talking about after you've killed him, hang his body there, or if this was the means by which he died. Now, God prescribes stoning in the Bible. Um, you know, hanging somebody on a tree, I don't know, I don't think it's talking about literally like a, a noose, like a, a literal hanging. I think he's referring to here is that after you would set him up as an example, you know, and they would say, so other people would walk by and say, whoa, you know, what happened here? You know, well, this is what he's guilty of. And they're saying, look, go ahead and do that, but don't, lay, don't thou, shalt, uh, thou shalt not remain all night upon the tree. He's saying, look, don't just leave him up there. You know, have some respect for the dead. You know, have some level of, of, of dignity here. Yeah, make an example of him. You know, take that rebellious drunkard. And put them up here and say, this is what happens if you don't obey the voice of your parents. If you're rebellious and stubborn, this is what God has prescribed. And then everybody else can get their act together. All Israel will look at that and fear. But he's saying, but don't just leave them up there, you know, stinking up the place and birds are coming. And it's, it's macabre, at that, or macabre excuse me, at that point. 
He's saying, look, uh, you shall, he shall not hang up upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. Okay, so he's saying, have some decency, for he that is hanged is accursed of God. And that's a very true statement. You know, if, if you're one who has been condemned by the word of, word of God for one of these civil infractions that are worthy of death, the Bible's saying you're accursed of God. <clears throat> I'm not necessarily saying that means this guy is, is going to go to hell, you know, but it's definitely, you know, in this life you could say that God wasn't blessing him. <laughs> That's not the blessing of the Lord when you're getting stoned and hung on a tree. That's, you know, the chastening hand of God. And he's saying you're going to bury him that day that the land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. And of course, this passage should remind us of Jesus Christ because of the fact that Jesus Christ was hung on a tree. And it says in Galatians chapter 3, I'll read to you, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, right? He suffered that punishment for us, the curse of the law. You know, we were accursed of God. We were going to suffer at the, at the, at the, the, the law of God. We were condemned, spiritually speaking. We might not have found ourselves hung on a tree, but we were hellbound. You know, that's where we were going to suffer our punishment. And God, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. You know, we often talk about the death of Christ and we talk about the physical aspect of it, which was horrific. And he suffered many things. You know, the, the pulling out of his beard, spitting in his face, beating him with reeds and whipping him and just everything. That, and I've preached sermons on that, you know, and it's, 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 it's a heavy subject and it's, it's a very serious thing. But sometimes we forget about the fact that he was made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. You know, the Bible says he had taken, he, he, uh, all our iniquities upon, he, were, were, were laid upon him. You know, that he, uh, that he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. And that's why at, at one point, Jesus had to cry out, Why hast thou forsaken me? Because God turned his back and couldn't look at him because he was accursed of God. That's the other aspect of Christ's death that sometimes we forget about. The spiritual aspect of it. That he was separated at that moment from his father. Somebody who he had been with for all eternity. And he was, suffered from, he was separated from because he was accursed. You know, so that verse should remind us of that. That, you know, that Christ has suffered for us in that way as well. That he hung a, a tree, uh, upon a tree for us. But really the, the, the primary application of course here is that God's all about justice. God's all about making an example out of evildoers that others would fear, that others would look at that bad example and say, I'm not going to let that be me. And that's the reaction we should have when we drive by these bums and these derelicts. Don't let that be me. That's right. I'm not going to grow up to be like that. I don't want to be a loser. Okay, That should be our attitude. And back then, God was saying, look, put him to death. Put him on a tree. Make an example out of him that others may fear. But don't let him hang there all day. You're going to bury him that day. You know, God is all for justice. And God is all about you know, balancing the scales and, and innocent blood being uh, accounted for you know, and, and purging society of, of, its, of its lesser elements, of, its, of the evil that's within it. But God is not macabre. You know, God is not grotesque. <coughs> God is not just... You know, trying to just just gross you out. You know, God still you know has a line that He doesn't want us to cross. And you you know, <coughs> the heathens did that. I mean, you remember what they did with Saul's body? I mean, Saul fell upon his own sword lest the Philistines should come and desecrate him. That's what he was afraid of: be abused and desecrated. You know, and that's what they did to him. They took off his head. You know, and then they hung his body upon a wall, and it was there long enough for for. Uh, I can't remember which, which house, which men it was, but there was a certain group of men that went there and, and, and took his body down. And King David, you know, rewarded them and praised them for doing that, for taking the, the body of, of, of Saul and Jonathan off that wall, the Philistines' wall and burying it, giving it a proper burial, bringing back the bones. You know, so people do do that kind of thing. You know, people can go to an extreme when they're trying to make a public example out of people. You know, and, and even... You know, I've even heard people say things like that. You know, we should bring back, you know, the public executions and, the, you know, the shooting, you know, the, the public shootings and all that, the firing squads, you know, and, and, and you see it even in foreign countries, you know, in Muslim countries, they, they'll hang them up right out in public and they'll just leave them hanging there. 
you know, God still has a line that he doesn't, he doesn't, you want to just turn into this evil, sick society that's just, because that's graphic. And it all goes back to what we started talking about this in the, earlier in the sermon. That God doesn't want us just to become hardened to seeing these graphic things. Because those type of things, you know, seeing a body like that, it should make an impression. That's the whole point. And if you just end up seeing it, oh, there's that body again, oh, there's that body again, oh, there's that, there's that same guy. You know, it, the impression wears off, you know. So, you know, there's a lot, a lot of great things in this chapter that, that uh, you know, we could learn from. You know, the fact that, you know, we should be careful how we live our lives. You know, young men need to not be this guy, you know. And that might not happen to you. That's not the law of the land. But God's going to look down and say, well, you know, if I had it my way, that's what would happen. Is that, you know, and, and we don't want to be a shame unto our father. We don't want to be a shame unto our mother and bring reproach upon their names. You know, we saw, you know, the importance of getting married for the right reasons. You know, that beauty's great, you know. It's, it's, you know it's, that's an important element, but that can't be all that's there. There has to be some, some substance, some character, uh, you know, in, in, in the person that we're going to marry. Uh, and, you know, and, and just these practical matters of how to deal with people that we've even put to death. People that have been put to death. They, you know, should be given some level of respect in being given a burial. So a lot of great things that we can learn from this, this passage. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.